Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be, from now until Christmas, we're going to be looking at different people who were in the family tree of Christ. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a banner over there that, that highlights the different people that we're going to be talking about. And uh, we're going to go in chronological order here. But the whole, the whole story of, of Christ begins with our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, and, and what happens right here in this chapter. So let's read Genesis 3 together. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the, in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desires shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So the story of Jesus begins right here with our first parents, Adam and Eve, and what happened in this chapter. The Son of God is without beginning or end, but, but Jesus Christ was born in a place and a time like you and I, and he has a family tree like you and I, and this is where his family tree begins. Genesis 3 is a tragedy of all tragedies. 
it's very difficult to overstate how momentous this really was. This is the epic fail of all epic failures. This is the moments when evil broke into a good creation and everything fell apart. This was the spark that ignited the fire that burned down paradise. This is where it all started. This is where all of our heartache begins. This is where all death begins. This is where all our problems begin. This is where it all started. And I wanted to just call your attention to a couple things here. Throughout most of the narrative, Adam and Eve are simply called man and woman. They're not called by their names until verse 17. And the reason for that, I believe, is that they stand for each one of us. Man and woman, we've all had this story play out in our lives. We've all disobeyed God. We've all turned away from Him. We all have sinned. And so, as we are reading this story I think we're supposed to see ourselves here. This was not just them making a mistake. This is us following also in their footsteps. Genesis 3 is the story of us all. If you go farther into the Old Testament, when God is talking to Israel in Hosea, he compares their turning away to to Adam here. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant There they dealt faithlessly with me. So this is supposed to be the story of us all here. We're supposed to see ourselves here, not just look down on them for making a bad choice. This is all of us that is playing out here. Let's look at the screen and let's answer this together. Did God create wicked people so wicked and perverse? No. God created them good and in his own image. That is in true righteousness and holiness, so that they might truly know God their creator, love him with all their heart, and live with him in eternal happiness for his praise and glory. This is the way it was supposed to be. This is the way that we were made. But that's not the way it ended up. There's something that uh, theologians talk about called original sin. And that basically means that all of us are born sinners. So this is not just the story of Adam and Eve falling into sin. This is the story of all of us falling into sin. And every one of us, but also even the whole creation has fallen into sin. And the Bible speaks like that. So Romans 5 verse 12, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. And then a little later, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So when this happened, all of us became sinners. So it's not It's not that we're born good and we're born innocent and then we get corrupted later on. That might be a popular way of thinking, but all of us are born sinners. We are sinners from the moment we begin to exist. It's not theoretically possible to raise the perfect child. Like if you gave them the right environments and all of that, they wouldn't turn out to be perfect. We are are born sinners. And so we have a nature within us that completely rejects God. Look again here. Where does this corrupt human nature come from? From the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise. This fall has so poisoned our nature that we are born sinners, corrupt from conception on. It's maybe difficult to understand, but this is, how, this is how the Bible speaks of it. In our story here, the serpent, just the way he talks, he is a master deceiver. 
he knows what he's doing and he does it well. In Hebrew, his sentences are, are very vague. It, it's hard to tell exactly even how to translate some of it. So the part where he says, did God actually say, that's, that's kind of a judgment call there as to what is actually going on. It's kind of a strange way to begin a sentence. And uh, when he says, knowing good and evil, the way it's worded, it's hard to tell whether he's talking about you will know good and evil or God knows good and evil. It's, it's, he's, he's, just, he's, very, he's very ambiguous. He's very subtle. He's just throwing doubts out there. He's not being precise. It's like he's not being truthful. Just a little bit of a side note. If there's ever any passage of Scripture that the original translation doesn't come out in English very well, it would be this one. When, when I translate Genesis 3, there is a lot, not, not that it's an inaccurate translation, the content is all the same, but in the original, there's so much more drama and passion of what is happening here that does not come out in the English so I'm, I'm going to do my best to try, to try to bring it out for you as much as I can here today. And again, it's not that the content is different. It's not like it's a faulty translation, but it just doesn't come across with the same, the same power that, that it does in English. In verse 1 there, when, when uh, Satan, or the serpent rather, he's not named as Satan, when the serpent... Uh, speaks first there. The question plants the thought that, that God is a cruel oppressor and not a loving provider. This is kind of like the beginning of sin for each one of us. When we have this thought that God might be holding something back from us, might not be up front with us, that maybe he's playing games with us, that there's something good right over here and he just drew a line in front of it, said, don't cross it. As soon as we start to think that, that's kind of the beginning of sin taking root. And this is where Satan starts. Maybe God is a cruel oppressor who's just holding stuff back from you. He doesn't have your best interests in mind. Whereas God is actually a loving provider and we can trust him. He is a good God. He knows what we need. And he will bring us through whatever difficulties that we experience. He's a good God. But this, this breach of trust of God, where God might not be a good God, that's where it starts. In verse 6, the actual deed here is brief and bumpy. It doesn't come out in the English, but when you read it in Hebrew, it's very awkward to read to pronounce in Hebrew. It almost makes you f- focus on every single syllable because you have to pay so much attention to what you're saying. So it's written in such a way as to be kind of jolting. This is where it happened. But it only takes just a few words to disobey, to, to destroy the whole thing. The delights of sin, they last just a moment but the fallout of sin is, is forever. And then verse 8. This is, where, this is where, when I was translating it, I really started to feel the, the power of this passage. Verse 8 begins a slow motion car crash of God's heart breaking. I, I want to just say that Genesis 3 doesn't deny that God is all-knowing, that he's all-powerful, that he's ever-present and sovereign. But in this passage, God operates on our level as if he were one of us figuring out what is happening in real time. And from the New Testament, we know that God operating on our level in somebody like Jesus Christ is not so far-fetched. But this is what's going on here. And as God comes to realize what has happened, even in just how he words these 
these things that he's saying, his heart just begins to break. And it almost brought tears to my eyes when I was translating it. Verse 8. It says at the start there, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Everything is good right here in just this brief spot. Verse 8 starts with the Lord on a lovely evening walk to visit. So it's the cool of the day, walking in the garden, and he's going to go see his people. The people that he made, he wants to spend time with them to enjoy their company and to visit. And it's going to be a good time, and he's excited. He comes in with a smile on his face, eager to see Adam and Eve. But the sound of him walking, what was once a sound of delight is now a sound of fear. Just turned on its head like that. In times past, the sound of him walking would have sparked joy in Adam and Eve, and they would have come running, you know, to, to, to greet Dad after he's been gone all day at work, or to greet Mom after she's been gone for a while. Hey, they're, they're back. But now the sound makes them run in fear. His beloved people don't come running to see him. Instead, they run the other way. It says literally in the Hebrew that the man and woman withdrew from the face of the Lord. They didn't want to be, they didn't want to see his face. So looking forward to a happy reunion, the Lord stands there alone and his eyes turn sad. Something is wrong. So God's words, where are you, is very short and sudden. In Hebrew, it's just one word. Something's wrong. It's, there's a startledness and there's a sadness. So it's like he's standing there alone, waiting to be with his people, and he throws out a quick question as if he stopped walking suddenly, realizing something wasn't right. And there's a kind of a sense of dread here. Something is not, something's not right here. He came to see them, and he's startled and sad that they would be gone. The way that he puts this question is interesting. He doesn't give a command. He doesn't demand that they appear. He doesn't even ask why they are hiding as if he knows exactly what's going on and he wants them to fess up. He just asks them where they are. He came to see them. He misses them, that they're not there. And it hurts that they would run the other way. The man's response it's like an injured little boy. It's full of self-conscious embarrassment over being naked. And the shame of sin means that God is someone to run away from. And then God says, who told you you were naked? That, that, that's an appalled, who would say such a thing to you? How did that thought enter your mind? Almost as if Adam is... A little boy and, and God is a, is a father whose little boy just said, all the kids in the playground just told me I was a, a stupid idiot. How would that thought enter your mind? Man expresses shame over the good body that God gave to him and created him in. There was shame over what's not created shameful. And there's now an increasing sense of dread in God. And God doesn't wait for an answer to this question. As if it immediately clicks in his mind once he gets those words out of that question, he asks the next one. It can only mean one thing. So that second question shows that God knows almost, but he doesn't want to accept it. Kind of a say it isn't so. Please, tell me, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm missing something. Say it isn't so. Did you eat from that tree? It's like he's hoping against hope that something else happened. The question is, word, the way it's worded, it's worded like God's mind is racing. Kind of like 
that, that tree, that tree that I commanded you not to eat from, did you eat from it? It's kind of a, a shattered sentence. And it's almost like God's world is starting to shatter. And then God asks, did you eat from that tree? And Adam is a guilty man. The guilty man's first word is the woman. And then the rest of his sentence blames God. As if pointing with his arms stretched out as far as it can go, he points to this woman. The woman that you gave to me, God, she deceived me and I ate. She gave me fruit from the tree. There's a, the way that it's worded is, Lord, the woman you gave, well, she gave to me. So, by the chain of events here, this is really your fault, God. Things just unravel even more. And then verse 13, God turns to the woman. And his words here carry this horror. Like, what have you done? Do, do you realize what you have done here? It's, it's, it's happened. It's like God's nightmare. His worst nightmare is coming true and he's living it out right now. And there's no waking up from it. And the woman gives a brisk response that is also deflective, but it recognizes guilt. She actually uses the words, I ate. Adam just says, she gave to me from the tree. Whereas the woman says, I ate. So now, God speaks to the serpent. The Lord's words to the serpent are an unbridled rage. The main culprit now has been identified, and we can only imagine the fire in God's eyes when he turns to that serpent, because everything good has been just taken away. And this serpent has destroyed everything with malicious intent, using deception, there's no question given to the serpent at all. This is, there's no excuse for what the serpent has done. This is pure evil. And this pure evil has destroyed literally everything, including God's access to his loved ones. And that anger in God's words there is, how good dare you? How dare you do this? Because you have done this, you are cursed above all other animals everywhere. And you are going to walk on your stomach. And your face is going to be in the ground. You are going to eat dirt the whole rest of your life because of what you have done. And then after God has that moment of, of rage against the serpent, there's a glimmer of hope in verse 15. Verse 15 is a hint of the coming Savior here. It's not, it's not entirely clear, but there's a hint here. The sentence on its own actually brings more questions than clarity. There's a lot of... What do you, you, you almost want to stop God. Well, wait, wait, what do you mean by that? What do you, wait, stop. What do you mean by that there? But he doesn't explain it. What does it mean that, why, why bruise? What is that about? And what does it mean that the woman has offspring or literally seed? I mean, this is not the way the birds and the bees work. What's going on here? But the hint here goes back to all of the honor and shame messages that we heard in the months past. He will bruise your head. You will bruise his heel. In other words, you will injure him, but he will disgrace you. Okay? In an honor-shame world, the foot or the heel, is the 
most disgraceful part of the body. It's the part that walks the dirty, dusty ground. It's the part that, you know, you walk upon. This is, this is the, the nastiest part of the human body. By contrast, the head is the most honorable part of the body. This is where you place a crown. You know, this is the part of the body that you kiss when you kiss someone. So this is the honorable part of the body. God is saying here, particularly potent in an honor-shame culture, that you are going to strike his heel. You're going to bruise it. But he is going to bruise your head. In other words, he is going to bring you complete disgrace. You are going to be disgraced. You'll get a shot at him, but it's only going to be his heel. You're not going to bring him down. He's going to hit your head. And on the cross, this played out pretty well. Jesus was injured, but Satan and evil was defeated entirely. It wasn't, it wasn't a close call. Satan, his head was hit. He was disgraced. Evil was dishonored. Death is rendered impotent. And sin is atoned for in the cross. We only have a hint of it here. If this, if Genesis 3 is where our story ended, if this is where, if we were children of Adam and Eve and this is all we knew, we wouldn't know a whole lot. But there's a hint of it. It's coming. In Romans 16, verse 20, I like the way this is put. It says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In other words, Satan's head is going to get crushed under all of our feet. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just his victory. It was the victory of everyone who belongs to him. And if you are a part of Christ then Satan has been crushed under your feet. In verse 7 there, they realize they were naked and they frantically try to cover themselves. They take fig leaves and they make loincloths for themselves. It's kind of a picture that we ourselves cannot fix the shame of sin. We might try, We might try to hide what we've done. We might try to cover the disgrace that it brings. But we can't fix it. We can't fix sin. We've got all kinds of technology and we can do all kinds of stuff that we never used to be able to do. You know, we can put a man on the moon now. But sin is still there. Everybody is still dying. One day, anyway. We we haven't fixed the problem. So they try to cover themselves, and it doesn't really work. They still run from God. They're not covered enough that they can still stand before God. It's kind of a picture of, if we tried to be good enough on our own, we wouldn't be able to stand before God. We would still have sin and shame that we carry. So at the end there, verse 21, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. This is, kind of, this is kind of a hint of what's coming too. Anticipating Christ, something had to die to cover their shame. There was, it says, an animal skin. That came from an animal somewhere. This was kind of like the first sacrifice. And all of those Old Testament sacrifices, they all pointed ahead to the, the one sacrifice. But it's all showing that something has to die for our sin to be atoned for. So God clothed their shame through something that had to die. When God clothes us with the righteousness of Christ, then our shame is truly covered. Sin is shame before the holy God and Christ is God's gift to clothe our shame. This is where it all started. And there's just some hints of what's coming. We know the end of the story, and it's a wonderful story. It's good news. 
that even though this happened here in Genesis 3, we can still be with God. We can still call Him our God. And our sin can be taken away. The problem is really fixed. The Christ, in a number of times in Scripture, is called the second Adam. It's like He's, he's the... He's the do-over, if you will. The one who's going to do it right on our behalf. So, this is the story where it all begins. It all points ahead to a coming Savior. Someone who's going to actually take our sin away is going to fix the problem. He's going to crush the serpent's head. Going to cover our shame. It starts here. Christ is the second Adam And he is God's answer to the sin of the first Adam. We'll be seeing more of this in the coming weeks, but Christ's story starts right here. This is where it all started. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. I'm going to leave you with this today. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, So in Christ shall all be made alive. He is God's answer to what happened here. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, what a a tragedy sin is that we would fall into it. And Lord, that we would disobey you and fall into sin and cause all of this trouble and death that we experience. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to fix it, to make it right, to atone for our sin, to crush the serpent's head, and to clothe our shame. Oh Lord, thank you so much. We look forward to the day when all will be made new. and We will be enjoying perfect harmony and unity with you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.